I got quotas to meet. <laughs> I, I got quotas, mate. To meet. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Michael Pishinari, joined by Luke Aegis and Martin Jung. Hey, another, how's it going? Another podcast. On today's podcast, we're talking about good old gym mate. Good old Jim Cameron. Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> the Big good old Jimmo. The, G- the, the, the good old JC. <laughs> yeah. The old JC, mate. He's brought us a little a little nugget, a little gift this year to, mm-hmm. to end end the year on a high note. Yeah, little... waited 13 years for this Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> 13 years, right? Yeah, 2009, it was the first movie came out. Isn't that just crazy? Like, mm, yeah. I was in high school when the first one came out. I remember going to the movies to see yeah. it, you know. I was mm. in primary school, I think. Me and Luke, we've come in from the perspective of someone that don't have a fresh memory of the first movie. And, but Michael, for you, you did go out of your way to watch the first movie to like refresh your memories on like yeah. the, what happened in the first movie, the, the lore and the rules of the world. And they gave so, a little l- l- recap yep. at the start of the film, because mm-hmm. as we all know, the first Avatar isn't exactly um, Shakespeare as far as like complexity or anything <laughs> like that. What did you guys think going into this film? Were you worried? Admittedly, I came into this movie very biased. Like I was, I was thinking that it was going to be like a over glorified sort of VFX demo reel. And it was just going to be like three hours long. It was just like very amazing CGI, but it would just be overstaying its welcome. But actually, uh, it turned out to have a more than serviceable story, I would say, in my opinion. Like I've always maintained that like beneath the veneer and the spectacles, you have to have good storytelling. And Luke, you mentioned like uh, after we walked out of the cinemas that James, like the good old JC, he had a he had a masterclass course mm-hmm. where he talked about people criticizing him for having very basic story, like un, like underneath all the spectacles and stuff. But then, if you can say that about his movie, the same can be said of like every piece of literature because like like ever written or filmed because like every piece of work is derivative of inspirations pulled from here and there. Don't you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's not about what the story, like how simple a story is, but how well it's told. Mm -hmm. Like films like John Wick don't get taken apart for having such simple stories and they're just revenge tales. Everything that James Cameron kind of like relies on is that whole sort of love story dynamic. If you look at everything, I guess for Piranha 2... And maybe the first Terminator. <laughs> um, it's everything he's made is based on a love story, and it's like mm. some. He basically hits these like you know he might not be the most uh, they might not be the most original stories, he, but he finds an original way of telling it or showing it. But no, this is a good point. Like, like just you have to nail the fundamentals to begin with, and mm. like the fundamentals are like you know standard character tropes of like the tough love parenting where mm. the dad you know Jake Sully actually loves his kids, loves his family. Then there's like the middle child who always. Feels feels like a disappointment and this is a double-edged sword that i'll get like more in depth into it's like the themes have been done before but they are like tried and tested storytelling that like you know we were talking about it's the kind of story that's like stands the test of time such as you know the conversation surrounding colonialism pandora being an allegory of american indians or like the aztecs being overrun by conquistadors Mm -hmm. and also just the theme of belonging and feeling like you're a foreigner in your own skin in the um the green book you know like feeling like i'm not black enough to be black feeling like i'm not white enough to be white and it's funny because when we were talking about um hawaiian pizza (laughs) i was like i don't know if i'm italian enough because i enjoy hawaiian pizza so i I don't know if i'm That's the, sound, that's the sound of <laughs> my the, ear is burning. <laughs> the voice of your, your Italian ancestors. That's it. I'm coming, coming out down on as you. an Italian. Hawaiian pizza is good. I don't give a f- what you Italians think. He's coming out. He's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> ah, getting back to Avatar 2 though. It was like refreshing to watch a movie and be mm. like, I didn't know they were going to do that. Here's the other thing as well. Also so long since we saw a 3D movie. Like, yes. I don't know. It Me felt and Luke nostalgic it in 3D. for us. And like, we're not even that mm. old. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, yeah. I saw it in 3D in 2009. And you just don't see that anymore. Like, it was a bit of an expensive gimmick at the time. You know, we saw these movies like Final Destination 3D and all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to yeah. say this is a resurgence of 3D and stuff. Like, I hope there isn't. Yeah, like <laughs> only, only one off for this, but sometimes they also do go a bit too far with the 3D. Like even the lens flare is in 3D and it's like, that's a What's bit What's the overkill. point? Avatar is definitely a movie you don't need to see in 3D. But we got to keep the glasses as well. Oh, which we should have brought for the camera. Yeah, oh, that would have been good. We should have like made this whole episode in 3D. That would have been great. We should have. <laughs> Martin, oh, yeah, that was a good 
Let's, head on the let's way. change cameras <laughs> mid roll. <laughs> let's just go through what we loved. The VFX and the mocap is like, for the first time, it's like my eyes can accept what I'm seeing as reality. Every object has like a weight to them, and the water physics actually feels. Uh, like accurate for the first time. Have you guys noticed that the water tri people, they have a slightly lighter hue of blue. Mm. So it's like just by seeing that subtle difference, you can tell obviously that these are people that has been in contact with like the ocean water their whole life. I think Jim, Jim James Cameron really, <laughs> did, his, really did his Jim research I. as well. Like obviously he was very much influenced by like indigenous cultures and all that sort of stuff. And I think unfortunately a lot of society does lump or to First Nations cultures as homogenous, and that's just not the case. I don't want to say metaphorical way, but even in like, you know, um, James Cameron's imagined Avatar universe or whatever, there's different nations within the countries and uh, within in that world, and they all have their own, you know, identities and everything. In a lot of ways, everything that he makes is relatively reflective of, of society. Like one thing he said in his masterclass about Titanic was that um, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, the climate and how we're destroying it is going to like come and and kill all of us. It brings up a point though, like, yeah, all of James Cameron's films are quite, like they have these bigger messages behind them and mm. themes like colonialism and, mm. and climate change and all that. So it's not surprising to see that Avatar 2 would keep going with mm. those themes. Mm. The other thing with the political stuff with this movie is like, I, I didn't have a problem with it, but there comes a point where it came at a detriment to like, the humans for example mm. the navi are super sympathetic obviously we sympathize with them but it would be nice to see something a bit more complex where the mm. human characters also have more motivations than merely just being like money so it's interesting you guys use the words villain before for the like especially for the human characters in it is this but spoilers no 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 Jim, james cameron he doesn't like the term villain he prefers the term adversary because not mm. no one is straight out of villain even evil people in this world have their own twisted way of justifying why they do the yeah. things they do everyone's a hero of their own story yeah yeah and like there's that whole idea that the road to hell was paved with good intentions etc etc like i don't think this is much of a spoiler Part of the reason in Avatar 2 they are coming back a little bit is because they straight out just say it. They don't go into it. They just say it. Earth is dying. And so we need to set up shop somewhere else. But like as soon as the humans come back, they start destroying. There's not like a, hey, let's have um, like a, a sit down kind of meeting. And mm. that just goes awry or some sh something like that. It's not like there's some attempt to try and be different. It's a straight out era. invasion. I it's get what you said. Straight out. Learn nothing from the first movie. No, we're mm. going to attack. We're getting them back for yeah. last time. And it's like if the Earth is dying and there's that desperation that they need to kind of live there, wouldn't there be some divisions that would be like, no, we should um, just live amongst them? And then mm. like others saying, no, no, we're just going to straight up attack. I have one more good point, and before we go, and before we eat up too much time, it's like Luke, like you, to you told me this like after we walked out of the cinemas. It's like, despite this being an interqual, like with some narrative threads that we will get into still not being tied up, it, this is still a pretty self-contained story. You like, feel pretty satisfied, yeah, with that. Like you know, it's got a beginning, middle, and end. There's been other movies like Dune and such. And a good friend of mine, Abel Robertson, and I were talking about it, where um, rather than having a beginning, middle, and end. It sort of just feels like it just stops in the middle of a story. And there's been other movies like that. Like, for example, like the second Pirates of Carib the Caribbean movie. I thought mm. it was the same thing. I remember walking out of the cinema kind of disappointed. It didn't leave me, like, on a good cliffhanger. It just felt like it, the story just stopped. Well, the good thing is that this avoids all the pitfalls of other sequels in that it has a unique identity on its own. By changing so many things that someone wouldn't have to necessarily watch mm. or remember like vividly every detail of the first movie, yes. but could still enjoy it. You got a whole new world, new clan, the water effects. We're rediscovering this new world. So we don't necessarily have to watch the first movie. Uh, I'm just gonna like boom, 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 a couple of goodies. Taking the time to build the world, massive improvement over the first film I feel with the water and the other clans the new characters like I feel like a lot of them have enough interesting features enough intrigue around them that you want to learn more about them everyone yeah. feels like they have a purpose and a place yeah. and a function in the story to well, that, progress or well, that they're going somewhere with it 
I just felt this film had more emotional stakes than the first movie. Oh, yeah. More emotional weight because yeah. of the children. Mm. He has, he's a father now, you know. Yeah, he's a father. Uh, Jake being a father gives him more emotional weight because now the decisions aren't, I'm just going to be a grunt and go into battle. It's more like, I need to do what's necessary to keep the family safe. There was a scene, like, right after, and this is slightly spoilery, but it's, like, right after he was too aggressive with in tone with his the younger kid, he suddenly becomes, like, vulnerable to Neytiri, and he was like, I thought we lost them. Like, and now we understand, like, oh, as a, as, as a father, that's why he is so strict with his kids. He's mm. doing it out of, like, fear, you know, and love. love. That's all my pros. So now we can get into the bad. You mentioned this before, and I was thinking this was like a pro and a con. It's like a double-edged sword where they conveyed the beauty of the world very well. As beautiful as it was, it, at a certain point, I did start feeling like it was getting a bit self-indulgent in its own special effects. It was starting to feel like a VFX mm. demo reel. It was like scenes where they were trying to convey sort of how connected the Water Tribe people are and how much the ecosystem and the biome means to them and their connection with like the the animals, their flora and fauna that lives there. But then at a certain point, I was thinking like, this could have been shaved down like by 10 or 20 minutes even. It's like, we get we yeah. get it. We get what's, what's at stake and then why it therefore must be protected. There's lots that could be shaved off. Yeah. For a three hour movie, I don't think it had to go for three hours. You get sort of 40, 45 minutes in, probably an hour and you're just like, When's the conflict coming? Like, don't get me wrong, there's been oh, little yeah. bouts of conflict, obviously, at the beginning, but you're sort of like wondering, like, when is X going to finally get in there and start yeah. shaking things up? Yeah. All right, let's go into spoilers. Yes, finally. Ah. Yes. Of course, Sigourney Weaver is character. Alive. I don't know. She's, well, she's te yeah, technically alive. I didn't yeah, really care great about Great mother. But of course, she's got a daughter, and, like, they don't know who the dad is. It's like, of course, they're going to bring that up later and figure mm. out who that is and blah, 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 blah. The other thing is as well, like, of course, what the Colonel, what was his name? Quaridge. I don't even Miles know. Quaridge. Whatever his I name is. I just call him the Colonel. The Colonel. <laughs> anyway, <the> Colonel <laughs> Forgettable Sanders. Forgettable names, yeah. No, no, um. Colonel <laughs> Sanders. And of course, You're not he's in Kansas got a, anymore. You're in Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> of course, he's got a son and he's going to be used as a device to kind of humanize this villain in some way. Like, he's obviously going to hold himself back yeah. at certain points. I was going to point that out as actually a, a pro because, like, at first I thought bringing back the exact same, well, okay, quote-unquote villain from the first movie was, like, a lazy choice. But then, actually, they, they actually did try to do something different to humanize him that, and add emotional yes. conflict so that it wasn't just a carbon copy and paste from I the first movie. I too. I had the same reaction to, oh, of course, freaking Sigourney Weaver's still in the movie because... Um, uh, her she had a child. Even though, like, when you watch the first movie, you're like, I don't see that that woman just randomly like having a child with someone mm -hmm. based on her character. But okay, it just goes to show they shouldn't have killed her in the first movie, and they fucked up. Mm -hmm. And then and with the Colonel, with the Colonel, I at first I was like, oh. it was done well though. The shock reveal that. The Colonel is a Navi was done very well. At first, I didn't like it, but then the more the movie was going on, I thought it's a good yeah. idea because it humanizes him, yeah, like you said, and it adds some layers. But yeah. I don't feel like they they did that. Mm. At first, I was like, this is good because we can see him interact with the son and see more of him being trying to be a father. But he didn't. That didn't really end up happening. Like if there was a nice moment, I, I don't recall like a, a wholesome a nice bonding moment, moment between yeah. them two. Like that's true. Like dad and son fishing. That kind of mm. moment where you go, mm. oh, there's something there. I guess what you said would have helped, but at the same time, it's like well, maybe that I, it doesn't need that because they just have that sort of familial connection. And I guess at the end of the day, Spider probably kind of always wanted a dad. You know, even if it was this asshole of a father. Or even if, like, you know, the, the colonel or whatever had talked to Spider about something that he had to do in the line of duty, but he didn't feel good about or whatever, but he was necessary to do in some other thing or he witnessed someone doing something. And then he was, was trying to, like, justify it in a... Obviously not in a, like, what his, his actions wouldn't have been good, but, like, you know, in a way that his son could kind of understand that sort of dynamic of why he is the way he is. Like if he said sorry to the son for some kind of memory. Yeah. I'm going to like uh, segue back to the point about the VFX that I couldn't say much more on because of spoiler limitations. It's like on top of, like I'd say the thing that elevates the good VFX and the mocap is just 
the acting. It's in my opinion, it's really superb. Like, and the one scene, spoiler scene in particular that I'm thinking of is when the eldest son dies. Dun dun dun. And then Neytiri, played by Zoli Saldana, she just lets out this like gut wrenching cry that no child should ever have to hear their parents make. It's just like such raw emotions as well. Like her voice breaks, and then the the facial mus like muscles just like clench like that. That's the same streaming. That scene, I did shed a tear for that scene. I didn't shed a tear for anything in the first Avatar, but that scene got me. And I kept thinking to myself after, I was like, I know nothing about that character. Yeah. I sympathize as a parent. I was going to bring that up. But for some reason, I still connected. Mm. And I, don't, I think it was purely the acting. It didn't deserve that. In all honesty, the character was not built well at all. It was just, I'm the perfect older brother. That's the thing. We didn't spend enough time with him. And that's one thing that I didn't like. At the same time, it's a three-hour movie. How much time are you going to spend they, with They've got to have tra- less kids. <laughs> I will, I will say, maybe it's not necessarily the problem of the length, limited length of the movie. It's like they need to reshuffle um, how they s- the segments of the movie, I think. Don't you agree? Like, yeah. there's still a lot you can achieve. If you only, like, maybe some scenes that were going on for too long, reduce that and then give more time for, like, the dialogues between eldest brother, younger brother, yeah. and so on. Just less, they just need to less reorganize. Of the, less of the world building. Because mm-hmm. we know that they can do that. They nailed that, 100%. But there was too much of it at yes. times. Like you said, mm-hmm. the, the overindulgence of, like, the, the VFX and just showing the spectacle. Remove the, the cliche kind of fighting within the tribes where it's, like, teenagers, typical bullcrap yeah. of, like, oh, my God, like, you're different from us, <laughs> so we don't like you. All that crap can get cut out. And then just focus purely on the brothers. One thing that I think it's not setting it up for the sequel. I can feel it in my bones. The surviving brother is going to be blaming, blaming himself for that. Oh, and the like survivor's we, guilt sort of thing. It should yeah. have been me. The oh, thing. Well, and, and they'll spend too long on it, you're saying? He's going to sort of think that the dad hates him for all that sort of stuff because the star <sighs> type thing. And he's going to blame himself because he's going to be like, it's my fault he died because I went out to the whale and blah, 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 blah. You know it's going that route because of things like the dad being like, you've done enough. And I was like, ah, oh, why do you have mm. to ruin the moment and say something so cliched? As much as I sort of like praised how... Well, he executes the fundamentals and like the conventional plot devices and story beats. It is a bit of a double-edged sword where it then becomes predictable. As a positive though, it's like, um, yeah, conventional story beats, plot devices. It feels almost refreshing in a way from all the crap that's come out this year. All the woke Hollywood and all the she-hulks of the Marvel. Isn't that kind of sad though, that conventional plot lines are refreshing now because of a year of shit? stories being told it's so but refreshing to watch something so textbook be <laughs> executed well you have this like conventional tale of a um of someone who feels like an outsider befriending a giant beast that everyone else fears but actually has a heart of gold but it's just simply being misunderstood or was like wrongly convicted and then that Harry beast Potter. Yeah, and then that beast ends up being the trump card in like the final act three battle. You know how it capsizes the boat. I knew it was predictable, but I think in a twisted funny way, I enjoyed it because like I finally there was something so textbook being like just executed once more. Well, that, no. there were some nice moments, just the whale and that character yeah. where I felt there was something nice about just the simpleness of them having this simple relationship where mm. there was no bells and whistles. Mm. You knew it was going to get paid off and it has an awesome payoff. You brought it up and arm for a fin. Yeah, earlier on, the whale thing shares that he lost a fin or whatever when his like, whole pod was attacked. And then later, the fisherman gets his arm sort of caught in the wire when he's wrapped around a thing. The, and Auss- then, the Aussie captain, yeah. Yeah, and then it goes, whoosh, and you just see his arm fly through the air. So he, it was like an arm for a fin sort of thing like that. Yeah. Like it was, yeah. Very poetic. <laughs> I thought way. it was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, yeah. I just wish when the arm went off that he went, Crikey! <laughs> <laughs> I've got a quote of the meat! Tis but a scratch. Tis but a scratch. The scratch, your arm's off! <laughs> no, it isn't. Well, well what's, what's that, that then? They have the whole exchange. Any last words? If you haven't seen it, I do recommend it. This is not a sponsored podcast uh, by any <laughs> means. I'm not, it's, I'm not, by, I'm not by James Cameron. <laughs> It's not like Cameron. <laughs> I'm not. It's not like I'm dressed blue and blue shirt and blue jeans and blue jacket just for and a blue water bottle and a blue cable like, cable and stuff. He's, he's, for he's Avatar hype. Well. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, no. do not belong here. <laughs> I see you. It's. <laughs> <laughs>
I do recommend it. I do recommend Blue it. Blue phone like, case. <laughs> in a lot of ways, it's very, it's very exciting. It's very, it's better. I would argue it's better than the first. Also, bloody one little fact I found out before: the cast actually held the breath underwater for up to seven minutes. And James Cameron, like, you know, flew a whole bunch of the cast out to Hawaii to practice this. And then them incorp trying to incorporate that into the narrative mm, mm. when the two were trapped under inside the cargo ship thing. Which, yep. by the by the way, that, I think that cargo ship is it's like a, may, maybe it's like a Titanic, a Titanic Easter egg. Because yeah. the, way, the way it flips as well and everyone clambering to, to the top before it capsizes. I mean, we, we know that James Cameron is obsessed with Titanic yeah. and water and... Huh. Celine Dion and Celine, <laughs> yeah, Celine Dion. <laughs> <laughs> slow your heart rate. Slow your heart rate. Every Father of mine. Night in my <laughs> dreams, I see you. I feel. Anyway, um, <laughs> any last words, Martin? I honestly like this movie. Yeah. I thought I thought I would uh, be too lost in the lore, thinking it was going to be too over reliant on the first movie, and that it was just over glorified like you know vfx stuff which sometimes it gets a bit too insult too self-indulgent but i was glad to see that they had a conventional like actually good story well executed i loved the film i i, I felt yeah that it improved obviously visually and story on uh, in every aspect emotional the there's actual emotional attachments. yeah hell yeah yeah shed a tear definitely superb acting as well that's you know back I, yeah well so. i i went in with just the only thing going into the movie was the dread of it going for three hours. And immediately yeah. once like the movie started, I was like, oh my God, I'm actually enjoying this. Like I didn't check my phone once. All right, that's the show guys. If you enjoyed this, please like, share and subscribe to the channel. And uh, go out and watch Avatar 2. Yes. Right now. Do it. Do it. Do it. And, no. uh, and if you can't, then dive into a pool of water and just enjoy that. <laughs> Anyways, all right. Thanks for everyone. Thanks everyone, and thank you to our new guest, Luke. Thank you. For me. <laughs> ah. Thanks, guys. Ta -ta. Have a good one. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>